building a happy planet, the word planet obviously indicates the environment, the ecology. We use the word World Happiness Summit to mean like people, geography. Planet is like ecology. And the planet isn't very happy at the moment, if we think about it. 2022 was the hottest ever year in Europe. London had 40 degrees for the first time. We have three times as much land that burnt in Europe last year than on average, or I think ever. Flooding has been increasing every year. I mean, actually, 2022 wasn't quite as bad as 2021, but on average, we're getting more and more floods, more and more extreme weather events. We particularly last year had a lot of droughts. Rivers that are used for commercial reasons and all sorts of things dried up. And in fact, as I took the train from London to come here, I was amazed how low the rivers were in Switzerland right now. So we have a lot of feedback coming from the environment. And it is undeniable that the world is warming. So this graph shows that the last time we had a below average temperature was about, for a year, was about 40 years ago. And not every year is quite as hot as the others, but we have a planet that is warming. So the actual axis on the left-hand side goes up to 1.2 degrees. We an awful lot of talk about 1.5 degrees as aiming to keep underneath. You can see how quickly we are shooting up towards that. So what do we do when we want to think about human happiness and we want to think about the planet? Now, as my introduction said, I'm a statistician, so I start thinking in terms of numbers. How can we start modeling this? How can we start creating something which helps galvanize us to act? And in um, 2006, I published something called the Happy Planet Index. That's whatever it is, 17 years ago. Actually, my first published paper on the long-term effects of climate change is from 1994. We've known about this a long time, but we're not creating much action. So I used to work at this think tank called NEF, New Economics Foundation, and I was challenged to come up with some sort of statistical instrument to do the relationship between happiness and sustainability. And my first idea was to do a survey and look at environmental values and think about whether people who are happier had better values or whatever like that. But I didn't have a budget. We're a small think tank. We don't have money. So I had to think of a way of using existing data. And in fact, I was sharing this with two people in a group yesterday when we were asked about to name one of our peak experiences. And I said mine was a day when I was walking up the hill outside my house with my, with my dog. Sadly, no longer with me, Monty, but anyway. And um, it's in England, and it's a sort of Neolithic hill fort, the hill I climbed up. And I walk there very regularly, and you get to the top of the hill, and you can look to your left, and you can see one of the most ancient pathways in Britain. It's called the Ridgeway. It's been walked for about 3,000 years. Look to the right, and you would see the cooling towers of Didcot Power Station <laughs> in the plains there. And I used to often think about it as I walked there, that that's the cost of our lifestyles. You look out there, beautiful landscape, huge, ugly power station. And on that day, because I was thinking about this environment project, my head just went, cost, that's interesting. Could I make an indicator which goes how happy people are and divide it by the cost of how much it, costs, uh, how much it made to produce it? And that's what the Happy Planet Index was. It came out in 2006. This is way before the Gallup poll, way before the happiness, uh, World Happiness Report. We had to scramble to get data. We had to approximize some of it. But me and my team created it, and it went absolutely ballistic. We produced lots of other ones, one in Europe, uh, an update in 2009. And then in 2010, I was asked to do a TED Talk on it. So that's, uh, hello, Nick, from 15 years ago, whatever it is. <laughs> you can see there's still some similarity. The shirt's still hanging out, the jacket's there. <laughs> Hair's a little grayer. Actually, it's even longer. I call this my long COVID hair, you know. <laughs> Shut up for a long time, and I, I think the look I'm going for is Druid, yeah, as I go up on my Neolithic thing. Doing a TED Talk is a huge opportunity. We're a small think tank. I mean, this is suddenly a global audience for an idea which is slightly out there. And I obviously obsessed about the talk. 
Uh, my advice for you is if you're giving a big talk and you're nervous, is wear your favorite shoes. Because if you're wearing your favorite shoes, you feel connected to the earth. And you know, sometimes when you talk, you feel elevated and you feel the ground under you and wear your favorite shoes. That's just a side tip on it. Anyway, so uh, the other funny story for my TED talk is that like this, they've got clocks, and I really rehearsed it so that I knew everything to the beat, the minute, and you had 18 minutes, and the clock is just ticking down there. And I do my talk, and I finished my talk, and I look down, and I've still got 45 seconds to go. And everyone's applauding, and my only thought is, what have I forgotten? What have I forgotten? <laughs> what haven't I said? You know, and I couldn't take in this applause. And in the end, I just worked out I spoke a bit quicker. Um, so I think that was all that went on. Um, anyway, I did my TED talk, and obviously, that had an impact, but you know, obviously not very much of an impact because we've, we've still got a planet that's warming up uh, and, and getting worse. So how happy is the happy planet uh, today in 2023? Well, apart from some institutional things, which is, which is actually really important, which is on Monday we announced that this think tank in Berlin are going to be the new hosts of the Happy Planet Index. They're called Hot or Cool. If any of you are from Berlin, they're a really good, small, young uh, think tank. My old think tank gave up on the Happy Planet Index about five, eight years ago, which was a disappointment. But we found a new home for it, and actually one of my old team is going to lead their work there. So we will be producing new updates going forward. But we did produce one in 2019. So, um, oh, sorry, before that. One of the things that we really still have to deal with is this obsession with growth. So actually, Gus O'Donnell talked about it uh, the other day. But we're obsessed with the idea of growth. And you might have blinked last year, but the UK had three prime ministers last year. <laughs> and this was the one that didn't last very long, but Liz Truss was obsessed with growth. So, you know, she says here that there's three things with the economy, growth, growth, and growth. But before we think this is just a right-wing agen uh, right agenda, so the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, also is in a speech in July saying there's three things, growth, growth, growth. And for any of you who are German, you might be able to read this slide, I can't do, but the German politicians are exactly the same. So we still have this massive obsession that we have to keep growing the economy. Now, what's wrong with that, you might ask? Well, oh, this is more the obsession of the growth, which is this is just the number of newspaper articles that talk about GDP. You'll see hardly any of them talk about sustainability, some CO2 emissions, some ecological footprint. We are obsessed with growth. What's wrong with that? Well, I'm going to put up a graph. I'm a statistician, so I have to do things in numbers. I think graphs are a really good way of communicating a tension between two variables. So when I plot a graph, I'm very keen that the outcome I want is going vertically, and the, 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 the thing I'm looking against it is going horizontally. So this is a graph with GDP per capita going vertically, ecological footprint on the horizontal axes. What you can see there is pretty much a straight line. And there's some interesting outliers, like you know, Singapore seems to be getting more GDP for its footprint than some other places. Don't know what's happening in Qatar. Well, I do know what it is. A lot of air conditioning, a lot of four by fours. I mean, basically, people shouldn't be living in cities and deserts. I mean, it's just not a natural habitat for humans to do that in any way. So, um, but you, know, you can see there that it looks very problematic, because the only thing it feels like we can do to become more sustainable is that is that we'd have to, you know, we'd have to shrink, we'd have to degrowth. I mean, absolutely no politician can go to the polls and say, I'm going to shrink the economy. You know, there's only three things to do with the economy, shrink, shrink, shrink. That's just not going to work <laughs> in any way at all. So it feels like it's mission impossible. And I think this is where we get stuck. We get stuck. It's everything about what we've got to let go of. We can't, to, to be sustainable. It's a, it's a very fundamental problem. And this is precisely why I'm interested in happiness. I mean, I'm interested in happiness now for so many more beautiful, rich reasons. But I came into happiness from a sustainability angle. That was my first reason to come into well-being, was can we break the language down of economics? I now just love happiness for its own sake. But that's what we did, and it's a very, very difficult problem. So what about changing the goal? What about changing the goal? And the goal is going to be the vertical axis, okay? So here we've got GDP per capita against ecological footprint. Let's plot well-being on the vertical axis. Whoa. We've suddenly got quite a different graph there. We've got one we've got much more space in it. I mean, look at this graph back here. Everything's on a line, really. Space. You know, things are opening up. Different stories are opening up with that graph. 
So if you'd noticed Singapore before, Singapore's now disappeared into the pack, yeah? It's sort of, it hasn't got more well-being per ecological footprint. It had more GDP, right? You can still see Qatar out on its own. Uh, Mongolia looks a particularly difficult place, very high footprint, not very high levels of well-being. But you can see different countries, and you can start seeing some interesting countries. So Costa Rica, you can see there. Are you Costa Rican? <laughs> Got more good news coming. Um, <laughs> Switzerland, there must be some Swiss in the room. Switzerland starts doing well, okay? You know, um, so, you know, Germany not so bad. Uh, UK is just in the middle of the pack there. And this really is the idea behind the Happy Planet, is to create new narratives that we need to do it. So um, the fundamental statement of the Happy Planet Index is that good lives should not cost the Earth. That is what it is. Good lives should not cost the Earth. If we are creating good lives and we're destroying the planet, that makes no sense at all. So what does a statistician do to do this? How do we calculate the Happy Planet Index? What was the idea I had up that hill with my dog? was that we should take well-being, as measured by uh, the Gallup World Poll now, um, we should multiply that by life expectancy. Multiply it by. What you basically got there is a happiness-adjusted life expectancy. Quality times quantity. It's a sensible thing. We have disability allowed, we have health adjusted. These are happiness adjusted. So first introduced by the Dutch uh, I think he's a sociologist or psychologist, Ruud Veenhoven, if any of you are Dutch. You'd be very proud of Ruud. In the 90s, he started to come up with an indicator called Happy Life Years and started to measure it. Also used in the World Happiness Report as well-being adjusted li uh, life expectancy. They did that a few years ago. But it's a really good thing. And also, we're trying to challenge policymakers here. By putting life expectancy, which is a key part of the Human Development Index, to, into our indicator, it gave them a solid thing that they sort of knew where we were starting from. A lot of my work is strategic here. <laughs> so happiness adjusted one. And then we do the radical thing, which is we divide it by ecological footprint. So basically what we're doing is we're creating a kilometers per an hour. We're creating a bang per buck indicator. How much well-being do we get for our chunk of planet that we use? Right? It's a metric. It's an efficiency uh, metric. Economics understands efficiency. How efficient are we at creating good lives? And for me, this should be the indicator of progress of every nation. I still hold that true. I know I've still got a lot of persuading to do, but I'm still just as passionate about that. And what do we see when we look at the data? So this is a graph of experienced well-being. So it's basically the World Happiness Report. The green areas, the yellow and the red, you can see them all there. Finland comes top, uh, last six years, uh, but you can see countries. Then the next one is going to be life expectancy. And you'll see it's pretty much the same graph. There's a few changes, like China goes green for life expectancy. India, anyone from India? I mean, it's pretty unhappy India at the moment. It's, you know, happiness is falling in India quite a lot. It goes uh, from red to green. But basically, happiness and health go together. We know that. You then put ecological footprint on a map, quite a different map. And that's that relationship we saw between GDP uh, going on there. When you put them all together, you get a range of things. You know, Europe is improving. I think it looks a little too green for Europe, by the way. I think it should still be yellow, really, but um, it's the way we coded it back then. But basically, there are different parts of the world doing uh, well and parts that aren't doing so well. Look particularly to Latin America and Central America. A lot of green there. In fact, that's... When I was up that hill with my dog, and I had the idea, I ran down the hill. And you can see I'm not the sort of guy that normally runs. I ran down the hill, pretty much. And I, and I went back to my laptop and spent three hours trying to find as much data as I could. And the first thing I realized that very first day was that Latin America was going to come top. And I thought, that's interesting, interesting. Uh, the other group of people that particularly do well are islands of the world, because they're small. Where do, where do you come from? Iceland, uh, uh, Iceland should do better than it does, but <laughs> you should do better. If, uh, <laughs> um, if you look at the top of the list, okay, um, Costa Rica is top. Uh, it's consistently top, yeah? Um, and you see Vanuatu, that's an island in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Colombia, that always surprises people. And then for the first time, we had a European in the top five, which is Switzerland. 
So Switzerland does really well on, on um, experience well-being and life expectancy, but its footprint is just bad. It's not terrible. So it suddenly comes up really well. And you can see that most of them are Latin American. You look at the bottom of the list, they're mainly sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Qatar obviously comes the worst. It's got such a huge footprint. But the European country gets in there is Luxembourg. Luxembourg sneaks in there. As a city-state, it's a little bit unfair in some ways because it's got hinterland, but basically the, the per capita ecological footprint of Luxembourg is appalling. This is a good way of looking at it. It's just compare Costa Rica. Here's Costa Rica. Don't worry too much about the top number, but you can see their life expectancy, 80.3 years. Their well-being happiness is 7. That's actually 7.0 out of 10. Ecological footprint, 2.65. Sustainable is about 2.2. Um, so they were above that. That's why they're yellow. USA, similar levels of life expectancy, a little bit lower. Similar levels of happiness. In this year, a little bit lower. Actually, if I was doing it now, they'd be a little bit higher, but roughly the same. But, you know, nearly four times the ecological footprint. So the USA is four times as inefficient at producing good lives as, as Costa Rica. We need to look to Costa Rica for our future models, not to the USA. I don't have anything against Americans, lovely people, but you know, it's a... Uh, so good lives don't have to cost the earth, it's basically where we're trying to go to. And here's the bad news, is that only a quarter of countries are within their environmental limits. No country delivers high levels of well-being on a low ecological footprint. But let's think of the good news, okay? Our current economic system has been designed, so we can design it differently. We can rechange it. And let's look at the fact that the secret to happiness is not secret. We know it. We know what happiness is about. This is a project I did in 2008 for the UK government, the equivalent of five fruit and vegetables a day, five things you can do for your well-being. They're not going to surprise you. Connect, relationships. Be active. You know, it's uh, about you know, moving. It's about taking notice. We might have called it mindfulness now, but noticing what's inside you, noticing what's going on around you. It's keep learning. It's giving. None of those cost the earth. None of them do. Health. It isn't secret either. What's the top predictors of health? Number one, happiness. Or social connections. But, you know, relationships, happiness. Number one predictor of health. Bigger than smoking. But don't smoke. It's really bad for you to smoke. Moving. Moving your body. Again, linked to happiness and health. Yeah? Eating well. Eating healthy vegetables. Uh, not eating processed foods, which are higher in carbon anyway. Sleep well. Sleep is the lowest ecological cost of any activity we do. <laughs> yeah? You just need another human to keep you warm next to you, and all's good, yeah? Good lives don't need to cost the earth. Secret to sustainability is not easy. Not easy. If you want to know what the top five things you can do to be more sustainable, they are these. Eat less meat. Eat no meat, but eat less meat. Use green energy. Make sure if you've got an electric car, the source of energy is sustainable. Tough one. Fly less. Don't fly would actually be the answer. I took the train from London. 11 hours of stress-free travel. Okay? Okay? <laughs> a little more difficult to get to the US. <laughs> but think of your travel as a pilgrimage rather than just for fun. You can have a lot of fun close to home. If you're going to travel, make it a spiritual experience. Make it something really, really learning. Make it something you really look forward to. Travel less is the only answer there, and there's no other way around it. Make things last. Move away from a throwaway culture. And use your power. Vote for green politicians. You know, sign the well-being manifesto, but you know, do things that actually do it. Vote with your purchasing power. Buy green products. You, know, you have some agency in this world. These are much less easier, they're much less fun, but this is the tough situation. Another way, let's have new ethical ways of doing business. Let's build happy, sustainable businesses. You might have seen this logo at the bottom, Friday Pulse. That's my business. We measure the happiness of teams because I think we need happy, strong teams to be innovative and creative about solving these problems. Uh, I'm not talking on it today, but check it out because we're brilliant. Um, and um, so the good news is we, we can redesign the economic system. It started. So, you know, I agree with Richard. Let's put well-being first. Absolutely, I think we should do that politically. I agree with Gus. Let's word it the other way around. You know, you've got nothing to lose but your misery. Okay? Or loneliness. I think loneliness is chronic 
in our societies. I think we should have more indicators of loneliness. And finally, you know, let's build good lives that don't cost the earth. Let's create a world we all want, where happiness doesn't cost the earth. Thank you. Thank you.